Thank you all very much. Um, and first off, I'd like to actually thank Guy and uh, Lin Lee for um, the performances that they've just given us. Um, and yeah, thank you. Uh, so I'd like to welcome you on behalf of Siobhan Davis Studios. Um, it's very great that um, Siobhan Davis was uh, introduced at the start. Um, I'm Charles Danby, who, as uh, Guy mentioned, uh, I've had the fortune of working with Guy, um, both in conjunction with uh, tonight um, and also um, on the works through the exhibition. Um, this is the first uh, in a new series of visual arts exhibitions that I'm working on in conjunction with the studios. Uh, and the collective title of that is, is Animated Environments. I mean, it's really, um, it's a series of, of three um, project exhibitions which will explore image uh, within time-based um, medias of uh, photography, film, and performance. Um, so Guy's exhibition is the first, and that runs to the 4th of November. Um, and it's, the studios here are open daily, um, and that's free, so feel free to come back um, during uh, that period. Um, another note is that um, a further section of this um, project is um, Guy is working in conjunction with the South London Gallery. Uh, so on the 9th of November, uh, Guy is selecting a programme of films, some of which will be his own films, um, and he's selecting that from the archive of Lux, um, which actually fits into a new touring programme um, where they're um, looking uh, within their archives. So Guy is, is going to be presenting a series of films at the South London Gallery. Um, and um, on, a, on a further note, kind of outside of that, um, the Siobhan Davis Studios um, are running another um, uh, visual arts-based project, uh, which is um, the uh, Commissions Project, which is happening at the Barge House, and that runs from the 4th to the 13th of November. Um, and that's very interesting because it brings dancers uh, and dance artists in, in direct collaboration uh, with their peer visual artists. Um, so uh, Marcus Coates, I know, is involved in that, and Lucy Skyer as well. So that, that's a, another program to look out for. Uh, what I'd like to do now is to introduce um, the panel here. I'm going to start um, by introducing Joy, uh, Joy Sleeman. Um, and Joy is uh, Head of Taught Theory and Art History at uh, the Slade at UCL. Um, she's written extensively on issues of the landscape um, and in conjunction with, with notions of land art, specifically or particularly through the work of William Tucker and Richard Long. Um, and she's also working uh, collaboratively uh, with an artist, John Timberlake, John Timberlake uh, looking at mappings, uh, urban mappings of London. Um, and then at the far end we have Stephen Ball, um, and it's fantastic to have him. Stephen is an artist uh, working in audio-visual audio, audio media, uh, installation and collaborative performance. Uh, he's a research fellow at Central St. Martins, um, and that's a, that research is attached to the British Artist Film Study uh, Collection. He's written quite extensively about Guy's work, uh, opening up ideas of the um, sonic and sound-based implications of Guy's work, um, and he's recently written for and co-edited um, a large Tate publication um, which is expanded cinema, art, performance, and film. So that's a 2011, that's a very recent um, publication. Um, and some of the territory of that is territory that we'll look at tonight. Um, so I would like to start by uh, asking Joy to open up uh, around some ideas of environment and the terminology of environment. Yeah. Well, I, I just really wanted to start with that word um, because it's a word that I've been really concerned with in uh, recent research. And uh, actually, I feel quite uh, honored to be sharing the stage with someone who can time travel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that last piece. And in, in a way, what I've, I've been trying to do is to recapture or revisit the sense of that word environment and actually environment, plural. Um, from around that time when we first moved, when was moved in the mid 70s, and I just wanted to start by 
Because you're reading something, which is a um, from a one of the World of Art series books. This is um, Environments and Happenings by Adrian Henry that was published in 1974. And it gives us a definition of environment um, from Alan Kaprow. I'll just read it. It says, the term environment refers to an art form that fills an entire room or outdoor space, surrounding the visitor and consisting of any materials whatsoever, including lights, sounds, and color. So that term is embracing both outdoors and indoors, which we just, we just saw in, in those films. And also, it's environment in a sense that, um, I think in, in more recent usage, has been very narrowed down to a kind of um, concern with ecology or green issues. So I was really concerned to try and revisit some of that vitality and expansiveness of that term. And uh, it seemed very relevant and appropriate to what we've just seen. I mean, one of the, the comments that uh, Guy made when I first proposed this was that maybe we needed a different word, so maybe reclaim the word from, um, for that kind of a meaning. I think <laughs> in, 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 terms of, in terms of working with Guy and, and, and working around this project, um, and the reason I, I asked Joy and wanted to start with an idea of environment um, was really because uh, there seemed something um, something very useful in the in the fact of the environment in terms of um, as we have tonight where there is a performative space so um, we're essentially watching an image we're watching a screen but we're involved in the environment we're aware of the, the movement of the projectors etc and then at the same time uh, there are these connections out to the landscape in terms of the content, the visual content of the film. So it's really what these uh, what these opportunities or, or collisions are, um, and that that's that's really the, the territory that I was interested to to open up. Yeah, I, I mean, I I think that I mean another word that I've been thinking of in terms of <coughs> excuse me this uh, guy's work in particular, but sort of generally is, is the notion of a kind of spatial practice in, in a way. And I think some of that comes through, I mean, one thing that's very clear to me that is a kind of a, a, a recurrent um, part of, or a recurrent aspect of Guy's work is, is this notion of uh, what I would call kind of uh, multi-temporality, where a number of um, times that are represented within the same kind of spatial um, environment. So, I mean, most obviously with things like Man with Mirror, um, where the, there was, what is this, 30, 35 years or so, mm -hmm. between the, the, the first performance and the most recent one being this evening. Um, but also kind of more subtle multi-temporalities in, in the staircase piece and the way that uh, that was shot over a period of time and, and what we're seeing within the space is, is, uh, is, is the, the projection of um, a number of time periods in the same space. So. I mean, so I'm thinking in terms of the way that uh, a num the, 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 the reproduction of a number of time, moments in time or, or periods of time um, actually becomes, a kind of it actually reproduces a space um, in a way. Does that mm -hmm. make any sense? Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a good way of describing it. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's a strange position to be in to have one's work discussed in terms of other sorts of movements and so on, but, or I mean, finding a language to describe one's own work, it's not something I've really spent much time doing, you know, the, the work takes up a lot of time, and I don't, in a way, maybe, maybe it's not my job to, to place it or describe it or to find terms to, you know, to pigeonhole it, because in a way it's about trying to create new um, possibilities. So it kind of wants to resist being pigeonholed. But, you know, I mean, I, I would describe my work, there are certain histories I would say it comes out of. Certainly, the filmmaker's co op has had a huge influence on, on my practice. And those of you know, who know the work of Malcolm McBride, the film action group, Anna Donner, Jenny Ardell, Billy Morgan, will see the influence of that in the work. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's interesting. I mean, it's something I have to go away and think about, really. You know, is, is what is the meaning of the word Nibbana to me in relation to thought? It's, yeah, clearly if it's a very, using the term in a very multiple way, you're talking about this amazing space here. And, um, you know, I think I, in making the work for this, you know, it's a wonderful challenge to make works that belong or fit in some way into this building its various possibilities and restrictions, because actually one thing we discovered quite early on, uh, we couldn't really stick anything on the wall. Um, so, you know, Brian said, well, can I put a picture here on Alison? And I said, no, we can't, because the, <laughs> the walls are, are sort of like made of this very special kind of, um, I don't know, with plaster with horsehair in it, which belongs to the period when the building was made. So there are all kinds of challenges and restrictions, but also possibilities in, in working with the space. So I would say, yes, I have considered the space here in, in putting this program together. And um, hopefully, you know, the connections that you'll be making to and, and watching the work. Thank you very much. Well, I, I, I don't want to put you on the spot, but uh, while we're talking about pigeonholing, um, I, I wondered what, what you thought in about your work in relation to ideas of, uh, of landscape, because especially in the work that's here, there seems to be a, a lot that is related to or has connections with people who are Well, that's, that's true. The funny thing is, actually, um, Lynn and I have just been to a little festival in Sweden, and uh, it was about landscape and film. And uh, we talked about this. And, and the man who organized it called John Sunter, he, he did say something quite interesting, which was that if you're dealing with landscape and film, it's, it's sort of removing all, in a way, it's kind of removing the things which we perhaps most readily associate with film, which are people, action, stories, all that kind of stuff. And you're left with something that's basically inert, apart from you know, time, weather changes, so very subtle things. And um, one thing that was sort of came out of that this year was the fact that the number of filmmakers represented there, Angelisa Hansen was one, she was behind me. She was saw the show anyway, and Lynn Liu and um, Ben Anikas and others, uh, Gunvor Nelson with, with and myself had all kind of used strategies for using the camera in relation to the landscape to, to create movement where it was essentially the movement was very subtle. Um, so yeah, I mean if you if you but dealing with film and landscape, it sort of throws you back onto the materials of how you're recording. So I think you know, it, it puts the focus very largely on on the making of the film itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But in relation to that, I'm, I'm, I'm interested because one of the early conversations that, that, that we had um, and kind of within the initial proposal and development towards, towards this work um, you were making reference to a, to a film and a film that was was shot through the through a, through a train, um, and you made specific. It, it, kind of, it struck me because you you talked very directly about the fact that this was the train journey. This was a this was a journey that you were making anyway because it was between it was the route that you took on a daily basis between mm -hmm. your house mm -hmm. uh, and your destination point, which I think was where you were teaching at the time. Um, and so, in a way, I, I was. I was curious about that, really then what the landscape was in that term and the fact that you, you, you were involved in the process of film, in filming, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an image which has a representational content. Um, but at the same time, there seemed to me to be a, a pragmatism and an economy um, around the fact that you didn't, it wasn't an image you were gonna go searching for. It was very much connected to you and your your space. Um. Well, yes, it's true. I mean, I mean, you could put it the way I might describe it, because it has a sort of diaristic aspect to it. But it's about my daily life, and yeah, I don't go out looking for stuff. Really, it just is happening, and you just have to notice it and find ways of recording or representing it. Really, um, and there's no need to be searching for 
So is it like a, a case of noticing things or things that Yeah, in a way, it is actually, yeah. So it started shopping a train, if you release those things, <laughs> which I'm different now, aren't I? <laughs> okay, that's a landscape thing I could do. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, um, <coughs> I've lost my track now. I think that was the thing. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. The, the things that, yeah, I mean, so, well, I haven't, no, it is, well, I did show a film that was shot on a train, which is The Wires, mm -hmm. you know, I think we all recognize those wires that actually shot from a moving train. I think, maybe we've all had that experience, haven't we? There's these sort of things which we know are made of metal and wood. They take on a sort of rubbery, dance-like kind of um, movement. And actually, that was another theme that I had in my mind in putting the show together, and that knowing this is a dance studio. Normally, this floor is covered in you know, layers of spongy stuff and dancers hanging about. Um, so I wanted things that were dance-like. So that, that one did have a dance-like kind of feel to it, um, and sort of, chore you know, sort of choreographic, that's another word I'm quite happy to use in relation to my work. Um, so, but it's to do with noticing things that just are there anyway, and um, maybe sort of finding a way to, to bring them out through the material of film. Sort of um, highlight them, and there's some little techniques there which you know, the film went through a certain weird phase of being split and then put out of phase where you get the central line. But there's some physical things that happen to the film. It's not just recorded in the pan and straight, and then you know, multiplying it by having three three um, projectors in that arrangement, not that arrangement. I mean, you know. There are very many, many possibilities of how you can put these things together. So um, one could also call it a kind of graphic interest in a way. Um, although it's not a, a word that's valued too much in fine art circles, perhaps. But you know, um, it's to do with the kind of you know design, arrangement of parts, making something that works as a whole. I'm not sure if you're I'm answering the right question. So no, <laughs> the connection with that yeah. is that because um, for me, interestingly, your your background before film was through painting, um, yeah, yeah. and the transition from painting to moving image for me is interesting because mm. um, my knowledge and understanding of it is that you were ver working very much with grid structures. Yes, that's true. I did do some work like that, and. Well, I think the thing with, with painting that um, you know, I had three years in art school, and twelve years, actually it was four, including the foundation course, um, you become very much aware of the sort of spatial dimension of paint or other materials on a surface and the kind of depth implications of these marks. You know, I, I, I teach, so I've often noticed to my sort of dismay in a way that other people don't see the same thing as you know, they might just see, they don't see what I see when I'm looking at a painting, which is kind of odd, it, and so it makes me think that maybe nobody sees the same thing. But you know, it's, it's the kind of how things behave spatially, and, and that's very much has been part of my interest in film. And there's a, there's a performance piece which I do, which is made around the same time as Man with Mirror, which uses a big polyphone screen, and I, I paint it white, as the film is being projected on. And it's a film of me tearing away paper until you see a landscape, and um, and you know, within the film, I, I, I walk through the frame, I walk, run off into the distance, and then in the actual projection performance, I slice through the frame. So all those things are to do with sort of um, bringing out the illusion of film, which is I'm crazy, but it's doing, creating that sort of illusion that's built window and then sort of destroying it as well and sort of reaffirming the, the, the materials that one's using. So all those things I think come directly out of an interest in painting. I, I mean, I, I kind of constantly also refer back to the idea of, I mean, I, I, know, I, mean, I wrote about this in this one, didn't I, but put the idea of music in relation to your work. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that's quite clear in, in something like soundtrack. Which, is, which is through the juxtaposition of um, those, uh, those those films, which 
the, the, the film was the, the optical soundtrack that was being activated by an image. There's a kind of syncopation there that, that comes through the, uh, the juxtaposition of different loops and so on. And, and, a sim and a similar thing is happening in Wired, but it's much more of a kind of visual syn syncopation and the way that uh, kind of grid structures are created through, uh, through the, you know, the multi stream. Um, so, I mean, I, this is just really kind of an observation in terms of, of, of the way that music kind of tends to have uh, the effect of sort of, I, I wrote a note, when I, I, I can't remember what it, what it was I was looking at, but I did write a note saying that there's, there's a kind of state of perpetually suspended animation in the work in a way, in, in the way that the, the, there's a lot of um, images that are, that are looped, that are repeated, and we see that in tree reflection as well in, in a very kind of um, palindromic kind of uh, arrangement of, of those things but but they but but they one way or another they kind of create rhythms that to me are akin to the kind of rhythms of music and the suspension of sort of uh, um, material in space in a way which is what mm. kind of music does in sort of very <laughs> abstract sort of yeah. ways yeah. Um, but yeah so that's also an interesting Yeah, I mean, and, and I have, you know, I've got a bit of, sli I've got, got a small musical background, so I slightly think of it. Yeah. And I come from a slightly musical family. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, by the way, um, I do want to say to you um, that the projection that's happening at, well, it's probably been switched off now, but the one that's in the sort of the research studio that's on the floor below this, which uses the two projectors that are interlocked. If you haven't seen it, do have a look on the way out. And if you think other, you know people who'd like to see it, encourage them to come tomorrow or Sunday. And the reason being is it may not run again. I mean, it's, mm. it's very temperamental. And it's been quite a challenge putting it together. I'm not an engineer, but I've, I've tried to sort of you know, do what I can. And it's just about hanging in there. The sort of ideas are there. <laughs> what we need is Mr. Lester to take a, an active interest, um, and then it would be absolutely fine, I'm sure. <laughs> um, but okay, so just want to say that. Um, but that's that's got us off the subject, which is to do with music. Yeah. Um, actually, I wanted to hear a bit more from you, John, because you haven't actually said. I haven't said very much. Very so much. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, I, well, actually, in connection with music, I, I wanted to pick up on something that um, s uh, a connection that um, Steve has made in, in his book to some more um, contemporary practitioners, because it seems to me that there's, there's some, there could be something very much wilder about showing 60 millimeter film, but there's something, I don't know whether the audience would agree with this, but there's something that doesn't seem particularly nostalgic, but seems to tap into something very contemporary. And one of the connections that... Um, Stephen makes in his essay about your work is a connection particularly with two artists who I know quite well, Emma Hart and mm -hmm. Benedict Hill, mm -hmm. who have done works, for example, where the projector becomes a musical instrument or where the film is fed through an electric guitar, um, which seem to owe so much to your work and to those kind of, of connections of, uh, between filmmaking and music. And also I think there's something about the kind of possibility or perhaps some of the contingent things about film <laughs> And it's really interesting with the, the film strip that you have where you can see the, how the cuts made the, the optical sound mm -hmm. and the, the, the piece of film that's, that's shown here. Um, and just kind of one, this may be really left of field, but um, you know, I think those kind of things continue. Like what's the, the possibility for something that's not deliberate in the media but is in kind of accidental can produce something really creative? Um, I don't know whether you've seen Emma Hart's current show. No, but she's Matt's Gallery. Yeah, yeah she's, she's got yeah. a show at Matt's Gallery, which I encourage you all to go and see. Um, but she's used cameras to show film, and the, it's sponsored by Fujifilm. And the only reason she used Fuji cameras is because it's the only one that doesn't go into factory save mode and strips the picture off. <laughs> so it's a really kind of tiny quirk mm -hmm. about the medium, but it becomes the creative mm -hmm. possibility. Mm -hmm. um, so I suppose I wanted to ask you a little bit more. I mean, the kind of technicalities of you know where the sound sits in relation to the image, for example, and those kind of things that are 
not accidental, but incidental in a way to make you feel that your work really makes something incredibly creative. Yeah, I mean, I really liked what you said at the beginning that um, the work, although it's, you know, it's 60 mil, it's clunky or projectors and it's, you know, black and white, nothing silent. If it doesn't seem nostalgic, that's great because that's everyone's first, you know, understanding of that kind of, me of this medium. And when I'm working with it, I'm not thinking nostalgic in this kind of nostalgic form. You know, it's just, just alien to me, that kind of way of thinking. I'm just sort of, um, you know, just, I just love the stuff and I'm exploring what I can do, you know. Mm. And um, if it does pick on up on contemporary sort of vibes, if you like, I'm, I'm really happy about that. And I think there is, it, it came through to me um, a few years back when I was showing a film called Railing, which also uses this optical soundtrack. And I mean, it may be unfamiliar to a lot of you, but um, the idea that the little fluctuations of light down the side, side of the film will actually create sound. And so if you cut through the film, as in sound cuts, you're making a, a sort of clunky sound too. Um, now there's a little picture of musical stairs on the stairs at the bottom, and that shows how the picture, the image of stairs that was recorded in the camera has been flipped into the soundtrack, and that also becomes the sound. But I was showing a, a similar film called Railings, um, and somebody came up afterwards and said, well, that sounds like stuff we're hearing, you know, in, um, in clubs these days. Or, you know, it's, 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 it somehow did tap into <laughs> something contemporary. I was really quite happy to, to realize that. Um, there's certainly something very gritty and very urban about it. Um, we mustn't forget the audience. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> on, on, on that note, um, if anyone does have any questions, uh, then I, I will keep an eye out. So just sort of alert in my direction, and, um, and then we can, we can work from, from there. Yes? I write poetry. I campaign in human rights for talking therapy for all. Um, so that's a brief introduction. I have two questions, please, uh, which I hope you'll take seriously. Um, first of all, I don't know what left of field means, <laughs> but maybe we can, we can talk about that afterwards. Um, last night I saw a show by Merce Cunningham, Dance Company, um, the final tour of England before the company folds. I believe they're then going on to New York and doing some shows for $10 a show, which is what Merce asked for. Um, I've had quite a difficult day because I met Merce Cunningham and um, he supported me in, 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 a, in a very gentle and empathic way. And um, I saw a show last night, the name of which I can't quite remember, um, in which the dance was made, I don't know how you put it, in parallel with a soundtrack which included lots of different sounds. Dogs barking, babies crying, um, amongst other things. There, were, there, were, there was a poem being developed on and off all the way through in a very light, almost ethereal voice. <coughs> Excuse me. And also, there was some Irish, I think, uh, singing, uh, Irish shanty, you may say. Now, um, my question, my second question was to be, why do we speak so much about technique and so little about what this process brings to the audience? And maybe the audience will have some views on that. But my main question is, uh, are the ideas of what's contemporary and what's nostalgic mutually exclusive does it matter, uh, in that show last night, must I leave thinking, well, uh, that was a show with a low level of emotional content, but with a little nostalgia which crept in, which really didn't make it quite, you know, all fit together. Okay, thanks very much. Um, I think to, to pick up on a, on a different aspect of that notion of nostalgia, what something that strikes me is that um, and, I, and I think it's, it's useful to bring into this, is um, 
is actually when, when in that early period in the 70s through the filmmakers co-op, then the 60 millimeter is an advanced, it's, it's, a, it's a new technology. Mm -hmm. um, and in a sense, um, you were exploring possibilities within that technology uh, and your work continues uh, to do that. Um, Yes, I mean, that, that's true. Okay, so I've, I've um, to some extent, bypassed the entire digital revolution. Um, it sort of went past. And I'm still doing the stuff. But, but actually, you know, I've got a video downstairs, which was conceived as video. The step is the, I think it's my first video as video, shot on a camera, a video camera, as opposed to translated from film into video, which I've also done. Um, so, and I actually quite like video, so I'm not really against it. But um, I just don't want to let go of all the wonderful possibilities that are out there with all these sort of digital materials. And you know, I'm, I'm again noticing through teaching that um, students always have a sort of fascination too for how an image is made in a material way. You know, we're so used to kind of these images just just being there, but not having any idea of what goes into making them. And with you know, film or photography, old style, it, it's actually quite an education just to make you know, still, a still photograph or, or to make a piece of 16 mm cine film. You, you have to understand quite a lot about you know, light and lenses and, 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 and um, you know, mechanics. So, um, that's good, and you know, I like it when, when you know what's happening. And it's also kind of, that feeds into the aesthetic in many ways. So for example, with a tree reflection installation using the two projectors interlocked and the one strip of film, we have the possibility of putting screens at the ends, but I just quite liked just using the bare walls. And similarly here, you know, we could have had a big screen, but you know, I just like having things where it's clear what's going on, so not, not hiding. So having you know, so having the sort of um, mechanics quite apparent to you, and also seeing the illusionistic things that happen through that very mechanical uh, means, is, is, it creates a nice sort of balance or tension, however you like to call it. Interesting that you use the word illusionistic there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm thinking particularly in. Um, I mean, er earlier we we talked, we mentioned the. Uh, or the kind of uh, fixed banded cinema practice that was located within the film co-op, um, which uh, was, was in many ways a kind of part of a, a, an anti-illusionist kind of project. Um, I mean, we're, we're familiar with people like Peter Goodell and certainly Martin Lagasse had some kind of role in, in this idea of expanded cinema as breaking, it, it as, as revealing the kind of relationship between film and cinema and, and the audience and um, in a sense kind of attempting to release the audience from being in a position of, uh, of, of being duped or being lied to or being, being, you know, being um, deceived by, by the illusion of the image. Um, but your work doesn't really do that at all. Um, I mean, it, it kind of actually uses the sort of the, the, the mechanics and the physicality and the, uh, the materiality of the medium um, in another way altogether, which again, I could say it's musical, I could say it's rhythmic, I could, or, or whatever. But I mean, I think that's that's quite quite an interesting um, way of of sort of framing your work, and perhaps that's probably where um, people like uh, Ben Gill and, and Emma Hart sort of are also working in the same way. There's 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 not an attempt n any longer for um, for an experimental film practice, if you want to call it that, or an installation practice, or, or, or something that has a kind of relationship with that, uh, that history, uh, to necessarily be in any way polemical in the way that it wants, you know, wants to have to be. And I, I guess your work kind of is not polemical <laughs> in, in, the, in, in the kind of any uh, intention. Not in, maybe not in a novel's way. Um, but 
Yeah, I mean, just, you know, I mean, Peter Cabell is a name that comes up quite a lot because in terms of that early period of 70s in England and, and the sort of anti-illusionist, anti-Hollywood sort of project that, in a way, for me, that's the wrong enemy. You know, it's not, okay, I'm not even trying to make that sort of film. But um, um, I, I, I think, in a sense, he was exaggerating his case mm -hmm. to make the case, you know, sure. that it was like, all about the material, but you know, if you take this little film he made called Clouds, was it with the airplanes that go by? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it wouldn't work if it wasn't if we didn't have the illusion in our minds of clouds and airplanes and, and you know, interesting things happening because they suddenly disappear, or pop up in unusual ways, or whatever. Um, so I think actually he's he's doing much the same thing. It's just the way he would describe it is in a very you know, really very polemic way, mm -hmm. and that was maybe a sort of specific period. That um, you know was where that needed to be said in a very strong way. Mm. Um, so he wouldn't he wouldn't describe it. Yeah, I'd be interested to see if he would agree, <coughs> agree with that notion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Whether uh, um, he does in fact see it as some sort of dialogue between the illusion and the material. Because I've only you know I've only heard him talk about the illusion in, in a negative sense and material in a positive sense. But you know, I would say that you, you need that illusion to create the sort of tensions that happen in watching a film. Mm -hmm. You've got to somehow believe in it as a, another time, another space, and so on. But also be aware of it as in this time and this space. You know, what's happening now in front of you. And also, in a sense, being made by you. Because you know, when you run three projectors um, together, they don't run in sync. So if you had any idea that these films will ever be shown the same way again, they're not going to be. They'll always be a little different, or quite a lot different. Um, so there's something that's quite live about the film, the films that you see. Okay. Um, because I think this man's question was sort of ignored as well. Um, you know, I think the, that this association of film and nostalgia is not very helpful really and I think that um, it's not a you know it, the, the practice has been I mean Guy you know the practice has been continuous and the fact that Emma Hart and Bender have got a show at the moment is is not a surprise so I, I am interested in that I think there is a there is a problem in sort of fixing in the discussion of somebody's practice that is such a sort of lyrical, um, thoughtful practice, just purely sort of rooting it in the technology is, is, in a, is a problem. And it would be nice if a discussion could sort of move somewhere else. You know, so I'm interested in its relationship to drawing and, you know, the illusion, as, you know, the sort of the, the possibilities of illusion that you're talking about. And I think you're sort of getting drawn down this thing of, it's surprising that we're working with film, and it, it isn't, you know. If I, if I could just say something, and maybe this re returns to answering the, the earlier question as well, which started with the thing about being starting left of field. I think one of the reasons that um, Charles suggested that um, we started talking about ideas of environment was precisely so that it didn't start with the obvious and talk about film. I mean, you can't avoid that it talks about film, but finding some other ways into to talking about that. So. Um, does that? No, it doesn't really answer my question because I think I mean I've been to so many conferences where we just get rooted in the the sort of surprise of somebody still working with sixteen millimeter and it, it like that practice is yes it was very very live in the seventies but it has continued and there's a whole body of people that have continued working so and you know guy is a great. Um, you know, Guy's work has been a great influence on, on you know, many filmmakers over that period of time. But I'd also like to sort of hear about those other resonances in, in the work. So, you know, I think that it, in terms of mark making and drawing and its relationship to sort of a fine art practice is very interesting. And we seem to be sort of skirting over some of those. I, w I was waiting to see if you were going to answer the lady's question before I said oh. anything. 
<laughs> I have a question, but I thought you were going to uh, respond well, to... Um, you ask your question and I'll... Okay, well, I was going to ask a question about film, so now I feel slightly <laughs> embarrassed. <laughs> um, okay, I'll answer Lucy's question. Thanks, Lucy. Um, actually, I, I thought I had, in a sense. I mean, I talked about my background in painting, and I talked about the sort of spatial... What would you specifically like us to talk about? Well, I think, like, you know, I, I mean, I've seen Man with a Mirror many, many times, but, you know, I think that's, that, in terms of temporality and illusion and time, uh, you know, I think that there's, there's such a rich vein of discussion of your work to be seen in actually a broader context. I, uh, that is an area that I'm sort of surprised isn't being picked up, considering, you know, with three panelists. I mean, there's certainly, certainly prior to this, there, there are ideas around issues of liveness that we have talked about, and perhaps those are, are, are useful to bring in, and maybe in some way we'll touch a little bit upon, the, upon, upon what, you're, um, what you're anticipating or, or, or wanting. Um, and in that respect, I'd like to, to point a direction to the, to the um, stair piece. Um, and something that struck me uh, through the installation period of that piece, um, and, and it's interesting as well because it's, uh, and, and this is something that certainly I've spoken with Stephen about, um, there's, a, there's another curiosity there in the fact that that isn't a piece that could be reconciled through a 16 millimeter projector purely because of the complexity um, of, of, of that arrangement. Um, so the transference or guise usage of, of, of video technologies within that, but in terms of an idea of, of liveness, which, which maybe comes into a slightly different arena, um, is something where the, the footage that guys produce uh, is filmed footage, is recorded footage, uh, and yet within the environment, within the situation of that work, uh, and within the consciousness that I think that we have in the current state through, through our connections to reality um, and, and uh, social media and, and, uh, and ideas of live feed, then um, I think there's an assumption or, or there's a connection that, that, that a viewer coming to that uh, implicitly or finds it hard to or, or stumbles upon the, the, the possibility of that being uh, a live feed, a live interface, um, which for me is a curiosity because it's not implicitly where the work is, is coming from. Mm. But it, it has a kind of uh, uncanny quality in, in the sense that, um, you know, when you, when you look at the, the projections on, of, of the staircase recorded some time before, um, which and, and what, one of the things about that I think that is interesting is that Guy has shot it in such a way that you do kind of see these disjunctions between the, the time that it was shot um, within the image itself because there are little jumps, there are little kind of uh, you know, elisions and so on. Um, but uh, yeah, the un the in terms of, and, and I think this is something that happens in, in the window piece as well in, uh, with where you, you've got both uh, the real live time, the liveness of the experience itself You've, you've got the recording of, of, of a you know, of previous time in that space, um, and and then with the window piece, you've got something that was that was shot seven, thirty-five years before. Was it? The same, <laughs> same year as the mirror, man with mirror. Yeah, yeah. And but within the same space and within the same plane of the image, you have reflections of the window behind you, and then there's this kind of uh, wonderful thing that happens where you see the the the, the, the reprojection of image from the glass on, on the door behind the projection. So I think there's, there's an interesting way that there's, there's this kind of uncanny combination of, of many different temporalities which kind of make up a sort of sense of spatiality. But I mean, this is the, the, the thing that I mentioned before, the kind of multi-temporality uh, of ways of representing and, and kind of reproducing and creating space um, in, in these sort of, uh, as an environmental
And, and those things, I don't think they necessarily have to do with um, questions around uh, the, the, the media, whether it's a, whether it's a, a, a film projection or a video projection. It's, uh, it's actually the way that these things then determine the space that we're in at the time that we, we experience them. So it's, it's about the environment of the, of the place we're in at the moment and the environment of the place that was reproduced in that place and the memory of that place and the memory of the, uh, the person who's making that and the memory of the person who's in there. So there are all these kind of multiple kind of memories and we hope we can go on and repeat them a bit now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, <coughs> well, in making those two video pieces, which is you know, the, the staircase and, the, and the, the window one, which is in a way quite a... It's sort of one that you may, may not notice in a way because it's quite slight in, some, in one sense. Um, although it's actually one that perhaps is interesting most. Um, it's, um, I had in mind actually the people working here that they'd be having to work with these things going on all the time. Um, when you put, say, a little staircase and there's three people, sort of three projectors running, they could run simultaneously and you could see a program that was going to repeat every 10 minutes or whatever you. One, but I've decided on a on a, a way of repeating the three images so it would be pretty much endless. Um, they're loops of different lengths. Um, they're not exact loops of different lengths, so they will keep changing a little bit. So the, the kind of connections that happen between people on the staircase is always going to be different. Um, and with the window, um, yeah, I sort of quite like the idea that so you might walk into that room and think nothing's happening. Um, maybe sit down and have a cup of tea, which is what it's for, and have a chat, and then sort of maybe sort of half aware that there is something, and that sort of change, you know, your consciousness is shifting a bit towards it. Um, uh, yeah. But, but I think there's, there's, there's a kind of um, a subjective experience of that space that happens with the viewer as well, um, that is kind of unique for each, each occasion. I mean, there, there are a couple of little anecdotes examples that I could give. For example, the first time I came to see the, um, the staircase piece, I, I went to the, to the actual staircase behind, and it was, a, it was an incredibly sunny day. And, and actually, the projection was harder to read because there was yeah. so much ambient yeah. light, but that, I mean, that was OK. Um, but also, what was happening behind the staircase was that uh, there, were, there, there was sunlight coming through the window. And so I was not only seeing the, your projection, but I was also seeing the shadows that were cast, mm -hmm. the reflections of various things. And that's also a similar thing to what is happening in the window piece at the front. There's the reflections in the glass screen, there's, and, and, and so on. So, I mean, I'm kind of interested in the way that um, they, the, 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 the kind of spatial environment is recreated each time one views that. Mm -hmm. And then the other day, on Tuesday, we were here, and I was seeing, I was talking to Charles about the work, and, and there was, I mean, what was a, quite a kind of bizarre, sort of vaguely kind of surreal experience, I suppose you could call it, there was a film crew in there that mm. were shooting a film on the, on the staircase. Mm. And um, there was a director or whatever he was saying things like uh, the rolling action, and then there were people running up the stairs. So there was this kind of live action, mm. this, this kind of conventional mm. cinematic cinema making experience going on mm -hmm. and then your installation behind be beside it and and and, a, and that kind of enhanced the, the, this sort of uh, sense of the un uncanny of the of the presence of the projection and the reality of somebody actually making a kind of conventional film in the space and, and all these things mm -hmm. sort of but I, I mean that's just a, a, a kind of particular example of the way that um, the space is made through the experience of the visitor to, to these these, uh, these, these many aspects which are not just your making, but you, you draw attention to them through uh, the projections of, uh, in, in the space that, that, that uh, reflect and respond to that space. Yeah, that's, that's a nice point. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> it's an observation. Uh, uh, there's uh, a question at the back. Is there? Is there yeah. Oh, oh, yes. Hello. Uh, it's okay. Can, can I ask uh, my film question now? Yeah. Um, it was, uh, it's a bit like the uncanny temporalities that uh, Stephen just mentioned, but specifically in um, the uh, Man with a Mirror, I wondered, Guy, how you personally felt about 
working uh, very closely, performing very closely with an image of yourself 35 years younger. Actually, I get asked that quite a lot. <laughs> and uh, I don't have any feelings about it now. I, I'm, I'm just trying to perform. I just do the performance. I'm trying to do the best I can with the situation. Um, yeah, I'm not, uh, you know, I don't have a little conversation with my former self or anything like that. Um, but, you know, I'll just tell you about a group that's been working with this film based in Sydney, Australia. And uh, they're called Teaching and Learning Cinema. Uh, it's two people, actually, Lucas and... Um, and, and, and is your name? Louise. Louise, that's right, yeah. And they've, they've um, started to reenact some of the uh, films that came out of the filmmakers' co-op, you know, sort of 70s period, which they can't actually get hold of in Australia very easily. So they've started to reenact them there. And um, they've taken this piece and they've done it sort of back to back. So Lucas has done it one end of the space and then Louise at the same time at the other end of the space. You know, they've recorded themselves on Super 8 and uh, they've interviewed me and you know, worked out how I've actually made the film in the first instance. Um, and now, interesting, they've taken it, well, they've, they've actually made an instruction manual for it, so you can actually download this do-it-yourself do it man with mirror. And uh, <laughs> I encourage you, if you're, if you're young, if you're, if you're young especially, you know, sort of do it now, and then uh, <laughs> work with it. Eh? Imagining uh, what it would be like if you remade the film yourself at your current age. Yeah, I, I could do that. Yeah, it's true. I could do it. I'd probably screw it up badly there. <laughs> but um, but what what another sort of take that they've developed it a little bit further, which I thought was nice, is that um, they've got their dads and mums to do it as well. So they've done this sort of performance with the mirror, and then the idea being that say when Lucas is like 54 or something, his dad's age, he can perform it with his dad at that same age, you know, which is quite interesting. Um, and I guess we could ask him what, what he felt about that. I'm sorry, I, d I, I don't know this thing about what you feel. Is, is, uh, I do have feelings, but I, I don't, <laughs> <laughs> I don't, it, it's not, I mean, I've done it so many times, I'm just like performing, you know, I'm just trying to, to do it properly. Like, think what to do next is what I'm doing, you know. And actually, I, it is quite easy to do in a way, because you, you just sort of look in the mirror and you react to what's what little, little glimpses you're getting in the mirror. So it's not like, it's not like I've had to memorize the whole thing. Um, it's more really a response or a, uh, a question, perhaps, to the lady who is, uh, doesn't want to hear about the film. Um, oh. Because I think <laughs> that Guy's work ask, makes us as viewers ask a lot of questions about the medium. And in a sense, uh, the thing that I really get from it the thing that uh, I find most exciting is the illusion, the illusionistic or uncanny quality of the work that we've been talking about. And for me, that's something to do with the way that you never lose a fact, you, you never lose sight of the space of the environment we're in, and you never lose sight of the images and the environment from which the images are derived. And yet there is this third thing that they create through the choreography and through the superimposition of images and, and things. And um, to me, the film is kind of the uh, cinematic, illusionistic medium par excellence, even more so than video, and it has this history. Um, and so, especially uh, also, incidentally, ideas about nostalgia and, uh, and temporality and this idea of you kind of dancing with your, your lost, former, now dead self, you know. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, that, uh, to me, that seems like a really interesting uh, dance with the medium of film itself. Um, I know maybe that's a horribly literal way of looking at it, but just an observation. Yeah, thanks. That's, that's very interesting. Yeah. So, My, my response to the film is that really they're, they're quite a perceptual challenge. They're, they're intriguing, and then they're kind of challenging perceptually. And I think that that, 
you know, we talk about process, but I think that one of the amazing things with Guy's work, how he brings all those things together, is the view of the process of making, of the materiality of things, to bring all those elements together, that from a viewer's point of view, from my point of view, um, they are a kind of, um, the, almost the formal, subtlety of a formal minimalism, plus the vision of challenge, I think are quite sort of, um, quite strength in this. In this. And I think that the, Man of the Mirror is a, also has that, but it also questions that we talked about before, issues of representation, issues of, of light, issues, all those kind of questions are wrapped up into that, in that film. I think that really brings all those issues together and a very strong film, in fact, a masterpiece in a way, and a very interesting challenge for the, for the viewer. You know? And I think all the films are, and they're subtly, I mean, a, visu a visual challenge. So I think that, that I think talking about the spectator and the actual sort of perception of them, I think also is, can be missing in the kind of in the discussion, you know. And I think that's important to also foreground the, the perception of the viewer's position within the film. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I think it's the same. Um, yeah. Does somebody else like to answer that? Hello. About this, you, your use of the of the term of, of formal minimalism, um, I don't know. This this will be back to you though to think about that. Um, could I just ask you to say a little bit more about? I, I just I like that combination of terms, but for quite sorry. But really, you guys were. I mean, uh, with a lot of the work, there is that that personal relationship to personal space, bringing in the personal space into that, and I quite like that. The, the fact is, you, he mentioned that he, you don't go out searching for things. They come to you, you observe and find, discover things within your personal environment. Uh, but at the same time, your choice of uh, uh, materials in the film is often kind of fairly minimal, quite, quite subtle what you choose to represent. So I think when that comes over the viewer, it comes over, um, well, when, it, when it's placed in this building, in, the envi in this environment, it's very carefully considered of its appropriateness to the space. And I think that's a subtlety which you've always always had in your work, which I think I really uh, admire very much. It's, it's a refinement and a, a subtlety, uh, 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 being aware of all the representational issues and process. At the end of the day, as a viewer, it becomes quite a visual challenge, perceptual challenge as well for the, the spectator. So I'm trying to get around this this issue to of, of not get caught in the jar on a formal minimalism, but yeah. no, I well, think well, the I only think reason that I, I thought, and my apologies to Ed, and my, my students are here who were talking about this earlier, and I suppose it's the art historian in me, but thinking about some of the first critiques of minimalism, which were around its um, theatricality, um, thinking of Michael Freed's writing on it, for example, and the way he talks about it being something that. Um, can't exist without an audience, as if it's waiting for an audience, and that it's only in that in action that the work happens. Um, is that kind of yeah, along yeah. the lines it's of that? Rich, and yeah. I, yeah. I think the difficulty with talking around guys' work is that you can you, you can foreground the materiality issues, the structural issues, I think a lot of the work comes from. But I think there's there's more to it than that. So we begin to talk around or, or put it on just one aspect of it, rather than bringing in all of the issues which the work brings together. And I, and I think that is one of the really interesting things about the work. It covers a number of things, uh, but at the same time, it inscribes, does inscribe the kind of viewer and percept perception, how those, those, those films are received. Mm. Um, and I'm sure that maybe a question to Guy, <laughs> that um, when in, in your choice of, of film, how, do, do you consider Clear, obviously, clearly the viewer and how the viewer might might receive the film, receive the film from, the, from the outside. I mean, it's an obvious. I suppose you made it an obvious question, but maybe. Um, yeah, I, mean, I, I think you know. I think I described that with the staircase piece and the window piece, and I sort of had in mind the people working in the space and how they would experience it when they come to work every day, you know, and sort of not wanting to make something that's very dreary because you know as soon as you can have something that's totally predictable and cyclical you know can you imagine coming into work for, for 
three months, and it's oh god, it's locked. You're locked into this cycle. Um, so that was certainly considering that specific audience. Yeah. Um, I think there is a, a, another dynamic to that, um, and in, in the program that we've had here earlier tonight, um, and I think this this goes to what you're asking. Um, Essentially, the program didn't start with the projectors. It didn't start with the image. It started with a very conscious decision by Guy to raise the blinds. And there, is a, there, were, there was a theatricality, and that was a very specific decision that, that Guy made. And that was quite an early decision. Um, and that also fed very directly into the opening with the sound cuts film. Um, and it's, it's the angles on the blinds as they go up, cutting into these diagonals. Um, and at the same time, and uh, if I'm wrong, Guy can correct me, uh, but, it, but I, I'm aware of reading uh, in text, um, and, I, and I think it's interviews, I think it's stuff that Guy's directly said, um, that when within a performance situation he chooses to perform Man with Mirror, then that has to be the last piece, because there it, it, the theatricality, the illusion is so high and intense that there is no other piece that he can perform after that. So correct me if I'm wrong. Or I'm offering you a challenge. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> well, yeah, we, we, we put it at the end. Yeah. That one or Paper Landscape, which is a certainly a companion piece made a year earlier. We have time yeah. for one more question. OK, yes. Is that working? Hi. Um, I just want to say fantastic work. Um, I'm not very familiar with your work. And this, this evening was, it was brilliant. Um, and I kind of felt before you said that you had a background in painting that it was really painterly um, and I felt like you, you were really sort of drawing with sound and um, yeah but my question is um, do you think that the notion of your repeated gestures have changed over time I missed the word that you, the notion of what gestures your repeated repeated gestures have they changed is that in terms of your performance is that in terms of okay yes in terms of your performance you know. Does the notion of my repeated has the notion of repeated, repeated gestures, gestures changed over time? Yes. The way I've used repetition in the work and things. Yes. You might um, have answered it already. I don't know, but I, I felt like I wanted to um, ask it. Yeah. No, I think there's been a quite a shift actually from the 70s to the 2000s, and you might have noticed a little book downstairs called Optical Sound Films, which I've made about, and it's got DVD, and it's about. Um, and, and the dates for those films are either the 70s or the 2000s, and nothing happened in between. And when I went back, or at least not, not on that kind, not on that approach to film, um, when I went back to those earlier films, um, I realised I was working in them in quite a different way. There, there were rhythms in the earlier films, but they're sort of ones I'd kind of premeditated and carried out, and in a way there was no opportunity to do it again differently. But in the 2000s, once I'd got um, some projectors, I mean these are four of Lennon, my projectors, and we have about 12 of them, um, and, and making multiple prints of these, project of these films, then you can, you can start to make things happen which weren't part of the original concept and that leads to new ideas, like the sound cuts is actually a new film, relatively new film. And, um, and I think I got much more involved in sort of the perceptual side of the work than I had. You know, I'd be a critic of my earlier work that it's it's not you know the kind of interesting ideas, but they they haven't really sort of um, maybe they don't really work well enough or something like that. Whereas, and there's something also about the live performance thing, which wasn't really part of that earlier work. So, um, you know, a good example would be one called Cycles, which I a sort of very laborious handmade film using sort of stuff on dots and punch holes, and it has an optical track, also made by hand. Uh, in, the, in about 2003, I started putting two of these prints together, slightly different sizes, and one was a slightly different color, and I could play with the, the focus, the levels of the sound. It became a sort of performative piece, and, and it's, um, it's a kind of... Um, takes on a bit of a trip, actually. You know. I don't know if any of you have seen that film, but it, it's, yeah, it's, it's got me, I mean, so when I'm showing that film, it's like a live thing that I'm, I'm sort of like trying to ride, ride this fucking bronco of a, you know, film performance. 
and get through to the end. You know, it's, there's something quite exciting about that. Like turning, turning projection into a live event. You know, in the past, I would have just sat back and switched it on and that was it, and just go through to the end. But I think in all of these pieces we've seen tonight, there's been interventions uh, while it's been running. I mean, there was when the wires started up, I realized I sort of hadn't put the frame lines back from the earlier film. <laughs> So you get these extra lines, but I sort of kept that there and and started to use that in relation to the the lines that are already on the screen. So that was you know that was something that happened just tonight.